He's perhaps the most famous fighter pilot ever, known to many as the Red Baron, to others as Manfred von Richthofen, and simply as MVR to swiftly typing netizens. His exploits are legendary. Much has been said and written about this intrepid Rotter Kampflieger, from his shaky beginnings as a pilot right up to his mysterious demise in the Somme Valley during the closing months of the Great War. Still, there are some things that even the most avid of aviation enthusiasts might not know about him. So test your knowledge with the incredible facts that I've gathered for this video. So who was Manfred von Richthofen? Born into the lower levels of the German aristocracy in modern day Poland, Manfred would be brought up as a good Prussian, eventually joining the cadet training school at Waldstadt at the tender age of 11. Manfred, like a true member of the Freiherr stock, was destined for the cavalry. At the outbreak of war, Manfred found the traditional role of the cavalry, reconnaissance, was soon made obsolete by the development of trench warfare. After coming into close contact with the German aircraft while behind the lines, his interest in the new technology was sparked. He put in for a transfer to the air service in 1915 as an observer, in essence swapping one mount for another. The flying bug didn't stop there. While still an observer, Manfred was taught to fly by his friend and squadron mate George Zoma, but it was really a chance encounter with the father of fighter tactics, Oswald Volker, that encouraged Manfred to officially apply for pilot training in October 1915. And so, a legend was born. Known primarily as a fighter pilot, Manfred von Richthofen actually spent the first months of his career flying two-seater reconnaissance aircraft on the eastern and then western front. It wasn't until his second meeting with Oswald Bolker in August 1916, who was on a recruitment tour in the east for his all-new fighter squadron, that Manfred was able to truly exploit his hunter's instincts. By September 1916, Manfred had joined Yasta II and achieved his first official victory over a British FE-2B from No. 11 Squadron. Another 79 official victories would follow over the next 581 days. But if you look at the official list of the accredited victories achieved by von Richthofen, you'll notice a strange phenomenon. Although the Germans were engaged with no fewer than four Allied air forces on the Western Front during the Great War, all aircraft lost under the guns of the Red Baron were fielded by the British Empire. Although not all the aircrew brought down by von Richthofen hailed from Britain, with Australians, Canadians, Rhodesians, and even an American among their number, there were no Belgians and absolutely no Frenchmen. Was this purely coincidental? Did the patrol areas of Yasta 2 and later Yasta 11 only include those contested by the Royal Flying Corps, Royal Naval Air Service, and later Royal Air Force? Or did Manfred somehow use his excellent skills as a tactician to keep himself out of combat with the French. There is no doubt that members of Yaster 11 did tangle with and shoot down French flyers. A case in point is Werner Voss, who shot down a French SPAD from Escadre 3 on the 10th of August 1917, and another from the same squadron a month later. Whatever the reason, had the French had the advantage of hindsight, they may have never called him Le Diable Rouge, but perhaps instead now before the comment section explodes in a flood of corrections, there is no doubt that von Richthofen did engage and shoot down French aircraft, perhaps even several. However, none ever made it onto the official list. While still flying as an observer, Manfred claimed to have downed a French farman over the Champagne front, using his single machine gun to do so but this victory was not officially confirmed. At the time, only those aircraft that fell behind German lines could be verified, though this policy changed slightly later in the war. When Manfred made it into the pilot seat of an Albatross C3 by April 1916, he again engaged with a French Newport, claiming to have downed it over Fort de Mont. Again, Manfred was not credited with this victory. Perhaps it was the heavy fighting around the newly captured fort that made it difficult to confirm the victory. Maybe the Freiherr was just jinx when it came to achieving victories over the French. Like many pilots of the Great War and even more modern conflicts, confirming victories was not as easy as it sounds. Undoubtedly, the real tally of Manfred von Richthofen's victories is not 80, but whether it's more or less, is still unclear. Not only did Manfred lose out on those early victories against the French, there is evidence that even some of his later victims survived their encounter with the Red Baron and made it safely back to base. 
while operating the Halberstadt D2 between February and March 1917, due to a production flaw with the newer Albatross D3, Manfred was to claim two aircraft shot down which actually flew home to safety. On Valentine's Day, and again on March 4th, Manfred attacked two separate BE-2s, which he claimed to have shot down, each of which reported back to the aerodromes and no doubt for a stiff drink in the mess afterwards. The previous year, it's likely that the same thing happened when Manfred claimed a two-seater FE-2B shot down. However, recent research has suggested that this combat was more likely to have been with a DH-2 single-seater, flown by the up-and-coming British ace James McCudden. The then sergeant pilot survived his sortie that day and landed back at base safe and sound. We will probably never know the true number of victories achieved by von Richthofen, but nonetheless, the official tally is still impressive. And if you like controversy, then do check out the video I made on Billy Bishop. It's a must watch. There are very few areas of technology which underwent as rapid a development as aviation did during the first half of the 20th century. Just to put it in context, when von Richthofen was born, the Wright brothers were still 11 years away from making their first powered flight. Even during the four long years of the Great War, aircraft made appreciable improvements in maneuverability, speed and range. This was because the belligerent nations were in a constant arms race in terms of equipment and tactics throughout the conflict. This meant that when your enemy came out with the superior aircraft, you had to continue to fight with increasingly obsolete equipment until an answer to the threat could be found. For the British in particular, these periods of being on the back foot have been immortalised in two distinct monikers, the Fokker Scourge and Bloody April. It was during the latter period of German air superiority that Manfred von Richthofen was to really make his name. While leading his elite squadron, Yaster 11, Manfred was to down an astounding 21 aircraft in just 29 days. This brought his score to 52 almost doubling it in a month. Although most of the aircraft were more obsolete two-seaters, Manfred still managed to shoot down six fighters during these dark days for the British. No mean feat. It could certainly be argued that Manfred von Richthofen was not the best fighter pilot in the German Air Force. That honour would probably go to Voss or Udet. What is clear is the fact that Manfred understood how to read a developing aerial engagement and position himself in the most advantageous position. Engaging an enemy two-seater could, at times, be more dangerous than tangling with a scout, something that von Richthofen would find out to his peril later that year. Nevertheless, his clear thinking and cold tactics helped contribute to the worst month of losses the Royal Flying Corps experienced during the entire war. For most people, when you ask them to picture the Red Baron fighting over the trenches of France, they will see him in a blood-red triplane. However, the aircraft so associated with the legendary pilot was not his main mount during the conflict. Von Richthofen only flew the production version of the Fokker DR1 for about two months between March 1918 and his death in April. While it is true that he scored two victories in one of the prototype versions of the triplane in September 1917, he had to swap it for a more reliable Albatross D5 in the interim. Like any aircraft rushed into service to plug a gap, the triplane suffered its share of teething problems, including structural weakness in the wings. Indeed, Manfred's own brother Lothar was nearly lost when his own Fokker DR1 lost its top wings, leaving him to gingerly nurse the wounded aircraft to the ground before it totally disintegrated. Nevertheless, during his last two months of operations flying in the famous triplane, Manfred almost matched his score during bloody April, and almost in the same amount of time. That being said, he only scored just over a fifth of his final tally while in the triplane, an impressive 19 victories. In fact, von Richthofen was to be credited official victories while piloting no fewer than six variants of aircraft and in at least 15 individual mounts. He was most successful in the Albatross D3 253-17, which he flew in during bloody April, but he had also helped combat test the D3 earlier in 1917. Again, the D3 suffered teething problems and Manfred was forced to switch to Halberstadt D2 in which he shot down 12 of his total victories. His total in the Albatross G3 was 23, which was nearly a third of his official tally. So when you picture the Freiherr diving to the attack, you better start imagining an Albatross 
rather than a fucker. I think that one of the most fascinating things about Manfred von Richthofen was that he was a household name even during his lifetime. This was in no small part to the book he published during his recuperation from his fateful encounter with the FETD from 20 Squadron in July 1917. Called Der Rotter Kampflieger, or Red Battleflyer, the book was an instant bestseller. It's probably why the British gave him such a dignified send-off, while James McCudden, a leading British ace, who nearly fell to man for his own guns, received a dismal and poorly attended funeral on a summer's day in 1918. De Rotter Kampfliger tells the story of Manfred von Richthofen's military career, including his early experiences of the occupation of Belgium. I had a surreal moment when I first read the book myself. I was returning from a holiday to the northern coast of Germany and was sitting in the car next to my German girlfriend of the time, reading the book. I just read the part where Manfred explained how, on an advanced reconnaissance patrol, he'd entered a town in the south of Belgium and climbed its church tower to view the surrounding countryside. He'd been concerned of the local populace as he was totally alone and didn't know how they might treat him. The town was called Arlon, and as I read those words, we pulled into the very same town being described in the book. It was where I lived and worked as an English teacher. It really brought the story alive for me. All this to say, had I been in the same place 99 years earlier and seen the young cavalry officer and shouted out, Sinzi de Rotten Baron, he would have looked at me with confusion and not just because of my accent. It was not until after the war that the term Red Baron became popular in English and German. Although certainly famous during his career as a fighter pilot, Manfred was known by other very different names. And I think he says it best in his own words when describing his first face-to-face -face encounter with the enemy. He writes, I'd never imagined that it would be so delightful to command a fighter squadron. Even in my dreams, I'd not imagined that there would ever be a Richthofen squadron of aeroplanes. It occurred to me to have my packing case painted all over in staring red. The result was that everyone got to know my red bird. My opponents also seemed to have heard of the colour transformation. During a fight on quite a different section of the front, I had the good fortune to shoot into a Vickers two-seater, which peacefully photographed the German artillery positions. My friend, the photographer, had not the time to defend himself, he had to make haste to get down upon firm ground, for his machine began to give suspicious indications of fire. When we airmen notice that phenomenon in an enemy plane, we say, he stinks. As it turned out, it was really so. When the machine was coming to earth, it burst into flames. I felt some human pity for my opponent, and had resolved not to cause him to fall down, but merely to compel him to land. I did so particularly because I had the impression that my opponent was wounded, for he did not fire a single shot. When I'd got down to an altitude of about 1500 feet, engine trouble compelled me to land without making any curves. The result was comical. My enemy, with his burning machine, landed smoothly while I, his victor, came down next to him in barbed wire of trenches and my machine overturned. The two Englishmen, who were not a little surprised at my collapse, greeted me like sportsmen. As mentioned before, they had not fired a shot and they could not understand why I had landed so clumsily. They were the first two Englishmen whom I'd brought down alive. Consequently, it gave me particular pleasure to talk to them. I asked them whether they had previously seen my machine in the air, and one of them replied, Oh yes, I know your machine very well. We call it La Petite Rouge. So did I surprise you with any of those facts about the king or baron of air races? If I did, let me know in the comments, as well as any other facts you think I may have missed. Also, if you found this video interesting, then please give it a like to help it spread to others. And as you got this far, why not watch the other video I made about how the Red Baron almost died in 1917, nearly a year before his final and infamous last flight.